Our last poem this week is called The Circus Animal's Desertion, and it's one of Yeats's last works. Again, it deals explicitly with the business of writing poetry. It has some notable formal qualities. It's written in eight-line stanzas in a form called ottava rima, and it has an unusual numbering system. Yeats doesn't number the individual stanzas, but he numbers the poem in such a way that we are compelled to read it in three sections. The first stanza makes up one part, then three stanzas together form part two, with a last conclusive stanza as part three. And here is how it begins. I sought a theme and sought for it in vain. I sought it daily for six weeks or so. Maybe at last, being but a broken man, I must be satisfied with my heart. Although winter and summer till old age began, my circus animals were all on show. Those stilted boys, that burnished chariot, line and woman, and the Lord knows what. What's odd here is that the first lines form a separate standalone statement, which is usually something you expect to find at the end of a stanza. You'd expect to find some sort of gathering of thoughts followed by an evaluation. So what we have gives us immediacy. Yeats spells out the crisis at the very outset. He can't think of what to write about. The circus animals are those elements that make up his poems and they have abandoned him. He feels that the fault is not his, perhaps it is age, at last being but a broken man, this amazing capacity Yeats has to make alliteration sound bitter. The directness is especially effective when we remember how often Yeats is mysterious and symbolic, hard to tease out. Now he tells us exactly how it is, he can't write. There's a difficult syntax at work in the statement that runs with enjambment or run-on lines from the fourth to the sixth lines. Although winter and summer till old age began, my circus animals were all on show. This obscurity corresponds to Yeats's own confusion. Why have the circus animals deserted now, having seemed to stay with him in the winter of his life as much as the summer? Should he be satisfied with his heart, having long privileged art over everyday life? The first stanza ends by introducing a method of retrospection, looking back, that composes the second section of the poem. He looks back at earlier works that he has written, interrogating his own motives and trying to figure out whether the effort was worth it. He focuses on three works about mythical Irish characters. You don't need to be concerned so much with the details of those mythical characters. What matters to us studying this poem is that now Yeats questions the significance of his own efforts. What can I but enumerate old themes? First, that sea rider Oshin, led by the nose through three enchanted islands, allegorical dreams, vain gaiety, vain battle, vain repose themes of an embittered heart, or so it seems, that might adorn old songs or courtly shows. But what cared I that set him on to ride? I starved for the bosom of his fairy bride. Yeats's purpose here isn't simply to write a new poem on old subjects, but to examine his own processes earlier in life as a poet. How did he write those poems and why? As a young poet, Yeats wrote The Wanderings of Ushin about a young hero who finds a land of eternal youth but loses it never to return. Yeats wonders whether he has been hackneyed as a writer, dealing in allegorical dreams that might adorn old songs or courtly shows. Perhaps he has been, in a way, exploitative I that sent him on to ride is a strong statement, as though Oshin truly existed and endured ordeals at Yeats's command. All for what? He satirizes his portrayal of Oshin's love for Neve as adolescent fantasy, starved for the bosom of his fairy bride. And a pattern is established that occurs again in the next two stanzas. Yeats introduces one of his old works on a hero. He recalls the artistic ideas that motivated the work, such as instructive allegory, but he ends up weighing the production against what has been lost in real life by his devotion to art. 
Here, he faults the hours spent crafting fantasies of fairy women for his failure to establish meaningful love affairs in his own life. There is opportunity cost to writing. Could he and should he have done something else? Similarly, the second stanza. And then a counter-truth filled out its play. The Countess Kathleen was the name I gave it. She, pity crazed, had given her soul away. But masterful heaven had intervened to save it. I thought, my dear, must her own soul destroy. So did fanaticism and hate enslave it. And this brought forth a dream. And soon enough, this dream itself had all my thought and love. Yeats is telling us about a play he wrote, The Countess Kathleen, which is about a woman who sells her soul to the devil to save the local peasants from starvation. It's well known that Yeats wrote this play as, as a vehicle for Maud Gunn, an actress for whom he wasted many years in unrequited love. And again, he's telling us that an act of substitution has taken place. He perceives now that the dream or the play has come at the cost of other life experiences for him. As such, the play represents counter-truth. There was fanaticism and hate in the public response to Yeats's play because it was blasphemous. And in this poem, he regrets his involvement with the theatre scene. He repeats the passion again in the third stanza of this section. And when the fool and blind man stole the bread, Cucullan fought the ungovernable sea. Heart mysteries there. And yet, when all is said, it was the dream itself enchanted me. Character isolated by a deed to engross the present and dominate memory. Players and painted stage took all my love and not those things that they were emblems of. Cú Cullen is the greatest warrior in Irish legend and in Yeats's lifetime had become a symbol for Irish revolution. But in one of Yeats's plays called On Balia Strand, Cucullin kills a mysterious visitor. Afterwards, he learns that he has slain his own son. He walks out into the ungovernable sea and in a gesture of futility, hacks at the waves with his sword. This is potent stuff, but Yeats realizes it isn't real life. The way that character is isolated by a deed, the single episode becoming emblematic. This is exactly how Aristotle says tragedy should be written. But Yeats sees now that he has gained mastery of literature or its emblems at the cost of the life experiences that literature represents. Those realities that should engross the heart and dominate memory. So he suspects he has wasted his life in preference of art over reality. But now that the material of poetry has deserted him, symbolized by the circus animals, he feels bereft. He feels like he's been left with nothing. The poem now moves towards conclusion. Those masterful images, because complete, grew in pure mind. But out of what began? A mound of refuse or the sweepings of a street. Old kettles, old bottles and a broken can. Old iron, old bones, old rags. That raving slut who keeps the till. Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start, in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. At last there is a glimmer of hope, and as in the other two poems, we can see there's an overall trajectory here. In Circus Animals Desertion, Yeats begins and ends by contemplating his lack of ideas. The poem opened with the vignette of a circus, and it closes with the vignette of a shop. His poetic visions have sounded very grand, by contrast, the foul rag and bone shop is grotesque. And yet, he has found the stuff of poetry here. Ladders is the giveaway term here. Ladders elevate us, they, they raise us up literally. Yeats knows that poems reach high ideals from lower origins, and he communicates this emphatically by the suggestion that materials for poetry can even lie in a till controlled by a raving slut. Old iron, old bones, old rags, these are unpromising things, but they can give rise to poetry. Perhaps they can be refined in the vain gaiety, vain battle, vain repose of a hero's life. 
the latter seems to be gone the means to develop raw material into poetry. Which leaves us, of course, with an irony that artistic failure becomes the subject of art. Art arises from a complaint that he can't make art. And so, wrapping up, the three Yeats poems are about what it is to write. The poet in relation to the audience, both ideal and real, the timeless purpose of art during crisis, and contemplations of whether a life devoted to art is a life wasted, despair redeemed by the way that writer's block can give rise to visionary poetry.